Article 22. The next uh, bill we'll be hearing is Senate Bill 51. Senator Carter, please join us up front and bring your panel as you see fit. Okay, we're still early, so we shouldn't grow too weary yet. Um, thank you, members of the committee that are here for listening to this really important bill, I'd say critical. I'm State Senator Jill Carter, District 41, and my panel, who has uh, so assertive waited to come up before I called. Um, I want to introduce them, though. I believe the people here, I have Michelle Hall from the Office of the Public Defender. I have... Malcolm Ruff, esteemed attorney and constituent of District 41. Yannette Emanuel from the ACLU of Maryland. My other constituent, this is, this is, this is, this is why people call me the people's champion. Um, Deborah Reynolds, you heard from yesterday. Um, and is there anyone that I forgot? Okay. Roberto Martin Martinez. So I had you down, but then I didn't see you. Okay, well, he'll, he's part of the panel, too. You can get a chair. <laughs> Mr. Chair and members of the committee, um, when it comes to the issue of legalizing marijuana, this issue is one of the most important issues that we're going to have to grapple with. Um, how we choose to move on this issue is really speaking about who we are as a state, um, how we respect the Constitution, how we respect and want to see better outcomes for Marylanders than what we've had up until now. Senate Bill 5-1 will prohibit law enforcement from using the odor of cannabis as a basis for the warrantless search of a person or vehicle. In 2022, Marylanders endorsed overwhelmingly the legalization of marijuana for recreational use. However, so doing does not solve the ongoing problem of disparate enforcement of the law, especially in our black and brown communities. The Fourth Amendment grants individuals a right to be free from unreasonable searches and seizures. However, the Supreme Court has long carved out exceptions for car searches when an officer has probable cause to believe that the vehicle contains contraband. Courts have held that the odor of cannabis does not provide probable cause to search a person or a vehicle. For example, the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania in Commonwealth v. Barr, April 18, 2022, recently held that the odor of cannabis is insufficient to conduct a search of the vehicle. The plain smell without more is not enough to conduct a vehicle search, according to that court. Courts have been mixed about this issue, and the decisions are ever evolving, but I believe that it's our responsibility in Maryland to give guidance to our courts. This is a matter of public policy. Allowing the odor of cannabis to be the basis for a search creates a loophole in probable cause determination as it is being applied after the stop, notwithstanding the fact that the cannabis, that cannabis is not the reason for the stop and the citizen is stopped under the influence of cannabis. Research demonstrates that police are twice as likely to search black people and other people of color during traffic stops than white drivers. Even though the data shows that black people and other people of color are less likely to possess illicit drugs and or contraband. In traffic stops evolve, involving black drivers, probable cause was used to justify 67% of searches in Maryland. In traffic stops involving white drivers, probable cause was used to justify a search of 46% 46% of the time. Senate Bill 51 would eliminate opportunities for officers to abuse the discretion afforded them in these situations and reduce opportunities for racial profiling. In this post-criminalization period, Maryland court, Maryland court decisions on this issue have been confusing and inconsistent. In 2020, 
the Court of Appeals, now the Supreme Court of Maryland, ruled that the odor of marijuana alone does not provide probable cause for an arrest or warrantless search of an individual. The court reasoned that the odor of cannabis alone does not provide probable cause because cannabis possession has been decriminalized and because an officer cannot determine the quantity of marijuana in someone's possession based solely upon odor. However, the same court, Supreme Court of Maryland, also ruled that while the odor of marijuana does not provide probable cause for a warrantless search or arrest, it does provide reasonable suspicion that the person possessed 10 grams or more and therefore justifies an investigatory, investigatory stop that could lead to a search. The Maryland legislature, us, we, we the, we the Maryland legislature, must clarify for the courts that the odor of cannabis alone is not a basis for the search of an individual or a vehicle. And so for those reasons, I urge a favorable report. Um, I had a chance to glance, to read through the bill and to glance at some of the opposition, and I think there is just one other point that I want to make clear regarding um, the, the, the concern or misunderstanding possibly about the issue of consent. So consent under, under Fourth Amendment has all, long been an exception, and this does nothing to alter that. And it, it, the intention of it is to do nothing to alter the exception of consent. When consent is given, um, that basically uh, takes precedent over what over the the Fourth Amendment other other issues because the person is consented to a search, but what this does do, or is 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 tends to do, is to make it clear that a later consent can't be used basically to justify or or make good a initial bad um, bad um, search, and so with that I'd love for you to hear from my esteemed panel, and I'm going to take my seat and listen for some what I think will be riveting testimony. Thank you member would like to go next. Good afternoon, um, Chair Waldstriker, or temporary Chair Waldstriker, and members of the committee. My name is Yannette Emanuel, Public Policy Director with the ACLU of Maryland. This last November, Marylanders affirmed with their vote what legislators acknowledged with the decriminalization of marijuana in 2014. The criminalization of marijuana is a misuse of police resources and is rooted in racism. However, legalization alone does not mean uh, an end to the disparate enforcement of marijuana laws or unnecessary interactions with the police. Marijuana odor stops and searches not only pose serious risks to people's Fourth Amendment rights, they enable racial profiling and dangerous unnecessary police interactions. In Maryland, the current legal standards, as Senator Carter pointed out, were made under decriminalization, and the court's interpretation of this matter has been inconsistent. That's why it's critical that the legislator must step in to ensure that the state's stance on this issue is consistent and, most importantly, rooted in the will of the people. Opponents will say that banning odor searches and searches, uh, odor stops and searches will impede uh, law enforcement's ability to investigate incidents of impaired driving. That's simply not true. In the, in the marijuana DUI context, just as with alcohol, an officer will need to have some evidence of impairment first before conducting a search or arrest. That is why odor of marijuana alone is insufficient to support that type of search. Public safety is the utmost importance for all of our communities, but diligent law enforcement can and should uh, solve a crime using honest, honest and evidence-based techniques without relying on pretextual basis like the odor of marijuana for stopping and searching people. Marylanders should not fear police interactions because of a lingering odor of a now legal substance, and legalization must do more than just allow for recreational use of marijuana or the state to profit. To be equitable, legalization must disincentivize dis dis well, disincentivize the pretextual police searches and seizures and unnecessary police interactions. And lastly, I'll say Virginia has already done this, and I think Maryland can get it right, too. For the foregoing reasons, the ACLU of Maryland urges a favorable report on SB 51. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Deborah Ramsey. I am a former Baltimore City Police Detective, Uniform Patrol, uh, Criminal Investigation Division, Drug Enforcement Section, Internal Investigation, Community Policing Officer, and a former private investigator for the State of Maryland. I'm here to represent myself and also as a member of the Law Enforcement Action Partnership. It is a nonprofit organization that mission is to improve the relationships between police officers, 
law enforcement officer in the community. And I cannot think of a better way of ensuring that we can have a more healthier and mutual relationship between police officers and the community. I am in support of this bill. I have also submitted my written testimony, but I would like to just say this. As a former police officer that had done many stops and searches <laughs> and warrants and all that, the chain of custody, not unless you were born with an acute sense of smell, how can you use that as a possible probable cause in a situation where you cannot bag that, submit that, it's inaccurate, it's unreliable, and to use that as a measure. So I would just like to say that I am in support of this bill, and I think this is one of the many ways in reforming police tactics to help relationships between the community and law enforcement officers to show good faith efforts that we do want to have that relationship again. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Malcolm Ruff. I'm a trial lawyer with the Murphy Firm in Baltimore, and I'm very honored to be before you guys today uh, in support of Senate Bill 51. Our firm supports it because it calls for social equity and pushes our state to strive to achieve restorative justice for the most negatively affected by uh, the unfair history of cannabis prohibition in this country. But we also support it because, at its core, it works to properly and practically safeguard the sanctity of the fundamental right to the reasonable expectation of privacy under the Fourth Amendment. Uh, this bill would relieve the courts from having to split hairs in this counterintuitive and perilous legal vacuum that was painfully highlighted in the OAG's report that came out in December, uh, and, and get rid of the guesswork. The critical question is how really practically should the legalization, or some would say the partial legalization of cannabis for adults, affect the Carroll Doctrine and the Plain Smell Doctrine? Um, the high courts have ruled uh, under certain circumstances pursuant to these theories, all of their rulings that have said that these types of searches are, are, are viable uh, have hinged on the fact that partial decriminalization did not render the odor of cannabis free from all uh, criminal suspicion. But once we make marijuana legal for millions of adults in, in Maryland, the smell will no longer be indicative that criminal activity is probably afoot or even that it's reasonably, uh, that there's reasonable suspicion that criminal activity is occurring. So the legislature should proactively remove this contraband classification from marijuana altogether because of doing otherwise uh, would convert probable cause and reasonable articulable suspicion to essentially uh, include a mere hunch or guesswork. Um, so we would ask that, that this body uh, favorably report back uh, on this bill, and we are strongly in support of the bill. Good afternoon. My name is Michelle Hall. I am an assistant public defender with the Office of the Public Defender. I have submitted quite lengthy written testimony in support of Senate Bill 51, and so I'll use my, my time orally to address just a few points. First and foremost, without this bill, the odor of marijuana will continue to be a pretextual basis for stops and searches. And quite frankly, without this bill, walking, driving, and existing while smelling like weed while black will become the new driving while black. This undermines not only legalization, but invites abuse of discretion for when and how police seek to investigate the odor of marijuana. Quite frankly, in my time as a public defender in Prince George's County, I had no cases arising based on the odor of marijuana on University of Maryland's campus, but quite a few cases arising in black neighborhoods and apartments in Prince George's County. Second, the failure to address this now will lead to another decade of litigation over what the odor of cannabis means in the Fourth Amendment context, just as with what happened with decriminalization. And more importantly, based on the, um, the court's body of case law on this issue, um, so long as possession of any amount of cannabis remains crime or civil violation, the odor of marijuana alone may continue to support a stop of, of a person or a search of a vehicle. And I think that is unfair to Marylanders seeking to legally enjoy and use cannabis. 
3rd. I'm sure that everyone in this room read or watched the video of the uh, Memphis police officers beating Tyree Nichols to death in the street. And I think the question we all need to ask is when should the police have the authority to forcibly stop, search, and detain someone and use escalating force against them? And I submit to you that in legalizing cannabis last fall, Marylanders did not envision, envision a world where the odor of a now legal product to lead to those types of escalating circumstances. Legalization mean, means nothing if the, its odor alone allows for the indiscriminate stopping and searching of our citizens. This is the most important bill related to cannabis that this General Assembly can pass this session, and we urge you to adopt a favorable report. Thank you. So let's, let's actually pause there and do four, and then you can join the next panel if that's okay. I don't want to get too far before we allow questions. So Senator Folden, please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I just wanted to... I was going to ask Senator Carter where the research, you gave a statistic about, um, I think, one in two arrests or Marylanders. I'm just wondering where you pulled that research from. When you I'm sorry. You early on stated about some research data no, that research suggests that. The two times more likely? Yes. That was from the, it's in here. I think it's the NY, a, a report that NYU did. Okay. And the second one is from, Mer so that wasn't. That, the second one was globally. It was nationally, like, twice as more likely it wasn't in Maryland. The yeah, second, I'm just wondering where, that, where those numbers came from. I'll, I'll find. I can find you the report. I just okay. I don't have it here. But All right. The Thank second you. one, the 67%, was Maryland numbers, which is available on the GOCAP website. Okay. I appreciate that. And then, um, so I just want to know, like, I agree that there is problems with this the, the passage and the legalization of recreational use of marijuana. It's created a lot of issues. And my concern is, is that what you're trying, what your bill does is it's, again, limiting certain um, investigative tools, for example, and I'm just going to take this as the simplest example I can. I, this doesn't have anything to do with, if a police officer's in behind a vehicle, Going down the road, there's a single occupant. Can't tell the window. You can't tell who's in the vehicle. The windows are tinted. The only thing you can smell is right behind that vehicle you're driving. Or you can see the number of occupants, but that's it. There's one occupant, and you smell the odor of marijuana coming from that car. Is that not probable cause to initiate a stop for driving while impaired? No, it shouldn't be, and I'll tell you why. Um, because the citizens decided that we should legalize it, and so it should no longer be used as a reason for a stop. Now, if that were coupled with something else, if that were coupled with reckless driving, if that were coupled with uh, weaving in, in, in and out of lanes, then that wouldn't be a problem. But the issue for this bill is that odor alone, odor alone should not give reason for So the, the strong odor coming from a car in front of a police officer and it's a known, it's a one car in front of them, should not be used as reasonable, articulable suspicion to initiate a stop on a product, much like alcohol would be used, um, for the potential concern that there's an impaired driver behind there, which by your statement is you don't think that that should be the case. So, so I'll, I'll take it a step further and then I'll say, We've passed this legislation, or this legislative body, this, the state has passed this, the recreational use. We're not talking about trunkfuls of marijuana. I'm talking about recreational use, marijuana, and that there is a recognized known that it does have, an, uh, it affects the behavior. It affects your react, perception reaction time. It affects you similar ways that alcohol does, so right? If there were reason to believe that there was someone that were driving impaired and there were symptoms or signs that that were happening, this wouldn't affect it. This is simply saying, if you don't have any other reason to stop somebody just because you smell the odor, it's not enough. Well, and this will be probably be for a, a discussion for another day, but my point I was getting at is we've passed something and we have no measurable standard 
in the state, in the system, to be able to determine if someone's impaired by marijuana, if they're driving a 3,500, 3,800-pound projectile and impact somebody else. What's the measurable standard? Maryland doesn't have one. So we have to go to a catch-all charge. That's a problem. Like these pe There should be accountability. It's been passed. It's going to be recreational use is legalized. I get it. But we're putting the cart before the horse here. We're not allowing the proper things in place to be able to properly monitor and keep the road safe. Exactly. And you're ta we're trying to take away this would take away another tool that, by your statement, of RAS for a stop, would it not? Well, I wouldn't take away using the odor of marijuana as a tool, um, as a pretext for other reasons to search vehicles and individuals, which the court has already said searching the, the individual because of the odor alone is already against the law in Correct. Maryland. So I want to use it as the pretext to go further and search a vehicle. This doesn't, I, t I think that um, Ms. Emanuel testified about how this doesn't have anything to do with if there's some kind of reason to believe that the driver is driving impaired or some other thing. This is saying this alone. So if, if there's another reason to think something else is going on, I, I don't think there's any okay. problem. No, I appreciate in it. Fact, in fact, I, I think that um, there is an amendment that would clarify that <laughs> because um, I want to make it clear that we're saying um, this isn't saying that there's no circumstance in the world where odor can't be a factor, but we're saying it can't be a yeah, standalone I mean, reason. It, I mean, we can all agree that, I mean, maybe not, but I would like to think that there's times you can walk by a car and it's a pretty strong odor and it's probably more than the amount that's for recreational use because it's that strong. But the, I think the issue, and I think... Um, former officer Reynolds talked about this is that it's unquantifiable you can't determine based on the odor how much what the quantity is that's not something you can determine okay I appreciate thank it thank you Senator Muse thank you. if I can uh, senator just ask you a question just for clarification um, when you can if you can um, find for me in writing the legal definition of the word solely. And I say that because this bill is based on or centered around, in my opinion, help me why I am wrong, solely. Um, and if I am correct, and I, I know what it means, it means by alone, by itself, just one <laughs> place. I know that, but I want to see if there's room to to expand that based on the legal definition as it is used in this bill, and it does refer to where it is. And if I'm correct, then would it apply this way? Um, solely would apply this way uh, if we all just left a, uh, what do we all have? To, well, we all have, have receptions down here. And we all had a drink. We all drank the same thing. And we all only had one drink. Um, well, that's not here, but... <laughs> well, yeah, I'm going, to say, I'm, I'm going to get to the other one, right? Let's say someone else had three or four, but we're going to come out and we're going to smell the same, right? And solely would mean, unless we're falling down the steps, unless we hit someone, unless we're speeding, uh, and they can couple it with something else, but if they said you, we smell alcohol on your breath, then everybody in that reception uh, would legally be able to be pulled over and uh, by a police officer for anything, we all smell the same. So we would all. So obviously that's not it. But if we, if if you and I have had the same thing to drink, and you just drive home, and I'm all over the road at 100 miles an hour, absolutely, I expect someone to stop, find out how much I had to drink. Uh, I can't tell by smelling if you've had five drinks or three drinks because it all smells the same. Correct. And I'm not an expert in in drinking, but I know a lot about it. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> my point is, my, my, my point is, how to solely apply here, and my friend just made an excellent point uh, when he said, hey, if you're driving all over the place, or if you've just, you know, you've just done something that we can, can we stop you? And I agree with him, we ought to be able to. So I'm struggling with solely. So that, that's exactly it. it that, you've, already, you've already explained it. You've already hit the nail on the head. It's just, you know, a standalone reason um, in order, if, if, should we pass this law? And I, and I would urge us to do so because I think it's critically important. If, we're, if, the, if the purpose of legalization was legalization and legalization for everyone, then we have to take into account our, 
our painful, troubling history of racial disparity in the way laws are enforced. And we have to take into account the fact that if we allow odor alone, it's still going to continue to be the same thing that we've had, which is more often than not people of color being pulled over, being searched, having their cars searched for no reason other than odor, and we haven't accomplished the goal of legalization. And so no one is suggesting that we should have a free-for-all of driving impaired all over the road. No, I'm saying if someone's driving impaired, you can stop them. If someone's, you know, bobbing and weaving, you can stop them. There's a reason, there's a reason other than odor to do that. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Any more questions for this panel? All right, seeing no questions, let's bring up our next panel, please. So please, sir, come on up. Uh, in addition, Martin Mitchell, Roberto Martinez, Charlotte Ahern, please. Good afternoon, Vice Chair and members of the committee. Uh, the Maryland Office of the Public Defender respectfully requests that this committee issue a favorable report on SB 51 because this bill will not prevent DUI investigations. My name is Roberto Martinez, and I proudly serve as a co-supervisor for, di for District Court in Montgomery County. In my capacity, um, I represent Maryland residents accused of misdemeanors and felonies. Through my representation, I have never encountered an impaired driving case attributed solely to the odor of marijuana. Most, if not all, impaired driving cases in Montgomery County follow the same investigative pattern. The National Highway Transit, excuse me, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, NHTSA, trains officers to observe the vehicle motion, make personal contact, perform standard field sobriety tests, and further investigate the impaired driving at the station. This bill will not obstruct this practice. I have handled hundreds of DUIs, both alcohol-related and drug-related, and tried dozens of cases. Again, I have never tried an impaired driving case solely on the odor of marijuana, and that is not for want of investigation by Montgomery County law enforcement. To begin, officers look for tri uh, traffic violations as signs of impairment, speeding, straddling lanes, turning too fast, turning too slow, stopping on a crosswalk, etc. They look for expired registration, swerving, accidents. There is no reference to the odor alone. Once they find a reason to pull the car over, the officer observes the individual. They look for indicia of impairment, slurred speech, bloodshot watery eyes, slow reactions, and poor coordinations. Again, this bill does not limit that practice. I can discuss a little bit further, but I know that my, running, my time is running short. But in, in conclusion, this bill will not prevent investigations at DUI. And for those reasons, we strongly urge a favorable report on SB 51. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Martinez. Who member would like to go next? Thank you. Hello. Thank you um, for this opportunity to testify on this bill. And thank you to members of the committee and for uh, Senator Carter for this important legislation. My name is Charlotte Ahern. I'm a staff attorney with uh, Maryland Legal Aid. The majority of my work focuses on workforce development and criminal record expungement. Um, we have a, a unique um, you know, viewpoint on this issue because although we don't deal with the uh, criminal trial and aspect of, of prosecuting certain um, charges, we deal with the aftermath. Um, so often many of our clients tell us stories of being stopped and um, essentially harassed um, by certain um, police officers uh, in relation to um, a, a traffic stop. Um, typically, when our clients come to us with uh, marijuana charges or cannabis charges, um, there are varying um, issues that take place during that stop um, that they feel like it's their first time ever being able to actually tell someone their story and what happened. And um, oftentimes it, it seems as though um, the only reason that the person is being stopped is because of some discriminatory uh, practice. Um, 
you know, as many people have mentioned, obviously we, Marylanders have voted uh, for uh, cannabis, um, to legalize cannabis, and for this bill to, to um, for this bill to be um, in existence, and if they were, you know, in, in law, it, it completely contradicts the votes of your constituents. Your constituents voted for marijuana and cannabis to be um, legal. Um, it would it gets it would continue to criminalize Marylanders. Um, you know, it do, it doesn't it doesn't necessarily. Um, Oh, I see that my time is up. <laughs> um, thank you very much. We urge a favorable report. Thank you. Greetings, uh, Chair and distinguished members of the uh, committee. My name is uh, Council Member Martin Mitchell. I'm the at large council member for the city of Laurel. Uh, some coined me the cannabis councilman because I'm a medical patient and an advocate. But today I'm here testifying on behalf of the NAACP Maryland State Conference as a political action chair. I would like to offer strong support for the passage of SB 51 because it, it, it will take away the fishing tool from law enforcement uh, in furthering the war on drugs, especially given that we overwhelmingly voted to legalize cannabis. I've heard assumptions. How about if I'm carrying CBD? Are they going to search my car then? CBD has been legal for several years. CBD, just like THC, has industrial medical um, benefits. I will share one story. I was a student at UMBC. I um, came home. I live uh, in Laurel. You know, very, very familiar with, with getting pulled over from the Laurel police. Uh, I would say probably 100 times before I was 20, uh, 25. Uh, but the thought is I came home. I went to the gas station on my way home to grab a Gatorade after wrestling practice. And, um, you know, I was in the parking lot texting. The, the police officer came over, I think, after uh, five minutes and, you know, then asked me a few questions. And, you know, then said he, he smelled cannabis. Uh, you know, asked me, you know, what I was doing. I was coming from wrestling practice. Still wearing the wrestling gear and everything. Come from wrestling practice. So then I had to wait 45 minutes, you know, for the dogs to come up. Uh, several more officers to come, right? Just, just one person in the gas station. Um, and, of course, they found no cannabis. They found no drugs. They found no guns. And they sent me on my way with the, you know, hey, I apologize. Sorry for wasting your time. But that's many people's stories, right? Um, so I urge this, deliver by, this deliberative body to pass SB 51 to ensure that Marylanders, um, you know, don't, don't have their rights violated because of an ambiguous smell of cannabis. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no questions for this panel, we'll move to the next panel. Professor Warnkin, Rusty Carr, Karen Kaplan, Joanna Silver. This is the final in-person panel on behalf of the bill. Good afternoon, members of the committee. I am Heather Warnkin, the executive director of the Center for Criminal Justice Reform at the University of Baltimore School of Law, here in support of Senate Bill 51. Despite the belief that people should be able to move freely throughout society, the privacy rights enshrined in the Constitution and the Maryland Declaration of Rights are only as strong as the doctrines and laws that have developed around them. In the case of the Fourth Amendment, a long list of judicially crafted exceptions combined to allow the government to stop and search both people and their automobiles, even when they are engaged in lawful activities. The evidence is clear. For many well-documented reasons, this leads to the over-criminalization and invasion of the dignity and privacy rights of black Marylanders and other persons of color at greatly disproportionate rates. While the statistics are staggering, the case law further demonstrates why weak privacy protections hurt poor communities of color the most. Specific cases included in our written testimony demonstrate why it is imperative for the legislature to act and not wait for the courts, which have been inconsistent and insufficient in addressing these issues alone. We also believe this bill to be in furtherance of rather than a hindrance to public safety. This discretion that too often invites officers to manufacture justifications or include lies in testimony, a disturbingly pervasive phenomenon. Over-reliance on searches based on odor of a now legal substance can distract police from more effective and evidence-based policing strategies and true investigative work, also a hindrance to public safety. This is especially problematic given the abysmally low clearance rates in many jurisdictions throughout the state. 
For these reasons and more included in our written testimony, we urge a favorable report on Senate Bill 51. Thank you. Um, thank you, members of the committee, and thank you, Senator Carter, for introducing this legislation. My name is Karen Kaplan, and I am a resident of District 18 in Silver Spring. On behalf of Jews United for Justice, I am speaking in support of SB 51. JUFJ organizes 6,000 Jewish Marylanders and allies from across the state in support of social, racial, and economic justice campaigns. We always like to begin with Jewish tradition, which makes it clear that we are obligated to respond um, when our core values are threatened, including the concept of Tselem Elohim, the idea that all people are created in the divine image and therefore are equally precious and worthy. We see the law as it currently stands, um, in which police officers may stop and search individuals without a search warrant merely because they claim to detect the odor of cannabis as a threat to that value. Maryland voters, as we've said many times today, have now chosen partial cannabis legalization. Surely it makes no sense for the odor associated with the use of a legal substance to be a gateway to entanglement with police and entanglement with the legal system. This is a problem of equity because we know that black and brown people are disproportionately stopped by police both nationwide and in our state. Crucially, there's no way for an officer to prove a smell, and of course no way to disprove it either, leaving the, odor, leaving the door to discriminatory pretextual stops wide open and leaving people of color significantly more likely to be harmed by police, something that happens far too often, especially during traffic stops. As has been said many times today, driving while under the influence of cannabis remains illegal, and this bill allows police officers to continue to investigate that. With this assured, there should be no reason not to protect black and brown Marylanders from violence, from unnecessary police interactions, and from legal entanglement in a system that data makes clear is weighted against them. On behalf of Jews United for Justice, thanks so much for the opportunity to share our position, and we respectfully urge the committee to return a favorable report on SB 51. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Joanna Silver, and I also live in District 18 in Silver Spring. I am testifying today on behalf of the Silver Spring Justice Coalition in support of Senate Bill 51. The odor of cannabis has long served as a pretext for officers to conduct stops, to prolong stops, and to search in the hopes that they will find evidence of some other criminal activity. We know, as many people have said today, that the weight of these invasive and often dehumanizing stops and searches falls most heavily on our black and brown community members because they are the ones most frequently targeted. Where I live in Montgomery County, from 2018 to 2022, black drivers were the targets of 31% of all traffic stops, despite being only 18% of our population. And black drivers constituted 43% of all searches conducted during traffic stops. These racially biased stops and searches come at a great cost. In 2021, black people were the targets of 54% of all use of force incidents by Montgomery County Police. I want to address two of the issues that opponents of this bill raise related to cannabis and traffic stops. First, pretext traffic stops are not a necessary crime-fighting tool. A report by the Montgomery County Policing Advisory Commission revealed that of all firearms seized in our county in a recent three-year period, less than 5% were seized during traffic stops. And again, as everyone else has said earlier today, this law will not prevent officers from investigating drivers who are under the influence of cannabis. I want to add that in my day job, I've worked for the last 20 years as a public defender, primarily in the federal system, and I cannot remember a single case in which cannabis was the substance that caused my clients impaired driving. It is almost exclusively alcohol and PCP that we see in DUI cases. There is simply no excuse to continue the racist practice of odor-based stops and searches in Maryland. For these reasons, I respectfully urge you to issue a favorable report. Thank, Thank you, you. Thank you so much. Questions for this panel? We have one more. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Thank you, Vice Chair Walt Stryker. Thank you, members of the committee. My name is Rusty Carr. I live in Mount Airy and uh, District 4. 
And uh, I rise in support of this bill with amendments. And I'm going to start by reading you a little passage from this book written by Dr. Patricia Fry, who's from Tacoma Park. It is referring to a Harper's Magazine interview in 1994 with Nixon's domestic policy advisor, John Ehrlichman. And he says, you want to know what this was really all about? The Nixon campaign in 1968 and the Nixon White House after that had two enemies, the anti-war left and black people. You understand what I'm saying? We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or black, but by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and the blacks with heroin, and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. Ladies and gentlemen, I hold in front of you hemp. It's also called cannabis, but this is legal and it's non-impairing. I invite you to smell it. It smells no different than marijuana because marijuana, hemp, and cannabis are all the same thing. You can smoke this and not get impaired, and therefore I urge you to amend the bill to remove the allowance of allowing the police to search within the reach of the driver, which will still allow the racial uh, enforcement and pretextual stops. Thank you very much. If you have questions, I will allow you uh, to smell if you'd like. And I have uh, samples to compare if you like. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, <laughs> any questions for this panel? All right. Seeing no questions from the senators, thank you all for being here. We'll now move to the opponents of the bill. Uh, Steve Kroll, Scott Schellenberger, David Daggett, Mike Lewis. Good afternoon. Scott Schellenberger, State's Attorney for Baltimore County. Just need to make sure nobody left anything up here for me to accidentally pick up. Um, so, uh, again, here we are, and I'm in opposition to uh, Senate Bill 51, because once again we are trying to codify what is been interpreted by the courts as probable cause to investigate a crime. Maryland has for decades allowed the courts to set the standards of what constitutes probable cause for a search. And once again, we're talking about a very specific amendment. Now the Fourth Amendment against unreasonable searches and seizures. And that's why this is very important that it be left to the courts because we're talking about interpreting the Constitution. And, you know, it may have been said that I misinterpreted what was being dealt with in consent, uh, but I would take a look at page two, um, letter C, it says, evidence discovered or obtained in violation of this section, including evidence discovered or obtained with consent, is not admissible in a trial, a hearing, or other proceedings. So that means we are now taking away an entire area of the law where even if you consented to the search, this law is saying, no, can't use it. No, you can't. Now, the question keeps coming back, you know, this is all changed because now suddenly marijuana or can cannabis is going to be legal. Have we ever developed Fourth Amendment rules of arrest and search and probable cause around a legal substance before? Oh, that's right, alcohol. We have tons of cases about how we interpret and allow police to proceed in cases for a very legal substance, and that substance is alcohol. I suggest that we allow the courts to do the same thing with marijuana once it officially becomes legal. The courts have already worked on this. 2017, Robinson versus State, odor of marijuana is enough to establish probable cause to search a vehicle, even in light of decriminalization. We'll see what happens now. Uh, Paccio versus State, 2019, odor of marijuana and observation of marijuana joint in the vehicle is probable cause to search the vehicle, but not search the person. Lewis versus State, 
need more than just the odor for probable cause to make an arrest of a person and conduct a search. So the courts have already been making rules surrounding these type of searches. All that's going to happen in July is one more change, and that is the legalization. And I believe it's the courts that should decide because they are interpreting the Constitution rather than a statute. Thank you very much. Mr. Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee, my name is David Daggett. Um, I'm here as a, uh, been a prosecutor for over 30 years, currently with the Maryland State's Attorney Association, but I'm also here as a parent and a citizen. Every state, every state across uh, the country, and I think there's 21 or 22 that have legalized cannabis, have seen a marked in uptick in, fa in fatalities, in vehicular fatalities related to alcohol and or cannabis impaired driving. Usually it's a combination of the two. There's a statute right now that, uh, that Maryland has, I know there's language to go in uh, that says a person, an occupant of a vehicle may not uh, smoke cannabis in a vehicle. The penalty for that is $25. If this crime, uh, if, this, if this bill passes, that's an unenforceable statute because you'd never be able, unless you actually saw the joint or the, the cannabis that was being smoked actually in the ashtray or something like that, you wouldn't be able to search the vehicle to find it. Therefore, you'd never be able to prove that particular violation. You couldn't do it. It's, again, as I speak, it's, it has to do with, with traffic safety and I'm just I'm just so terribly concerned about the number of fatalities that will go up we have enough fatal crashes across the country and in Maryland related to alcohol if you start legalizing and allow people to smoke cannabis in the vehicle it's only going to make it worse one of my one of the things I see Michigan for instance and I'm not while I'm not advocating or not supporting this bill in any way I would say Michigan differentiates and distinguishes between the smell of burnt cannabis and the smell of raw cannabis. The smell of raw cannabis in Michigan, you cannot search a vehicle. The smell of burnt cannabis, you can because they do not want people smoking in a vehicle because of the safety concerns. And I see I have no time left, and so with that, I would urge an unfavorable report. Thank you. Mr. Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, distinguished members of the committee. My name is Mike Lewis. I'm a sheriff of Wicomico County, Maryland. I'm here to represent the Maryland Sheriff's Association and the Maryland Chiefs of Police Association and our opposition to Senate Bill 51. This bill would certainly prohibit the odor of cannabis alone from providing either reasonable, articulable suspicion or probable cause to search a motor vehicle. Currently, possession of cannabis in any amount is illegal in Maryland subject to rare exceptions, such as being a lawful holder of a medical cannabis card. Beginning on Ju July the 1st of 2023, this year, individuals will be able to, be able to lawfully possess up to 1.5 ounces of cannabis. Possession of any amount of cannabis beyond that will continue to be illegal in the state of Maryland, with criminal penalties assessed to more than 2.5 ounces. Possession of cannabis by individuals under the age of 21 will also continue to be illegal in the state of Maryland regardless of the amount. Recognizing that cannabis remain presumptively contraband, Maryland's Court of Appeals, now the Supreme Court of the State of Maryland, has held that the odor of cannabis alone provides a law enforcement officer with probable cause to search a vehicle for contraband and reasonable articulable suspicion to briefly detain to investigate if a criminal offense is occurring. As a 38-year veteran of law enforcement, 22 years as Maryland State Trooper, now in my fifth term, as Sheriff of Wicomico County, I can tell you firsthand that I cannot distinguish based on the odor of marijuana coming from a car, whether it's an ounce in that car, an eight ball in that car, or 100 pounds in that car. I can tell you we frequently have stopped automobiles with several hundred pounds of marijuana in the car based on a probable cause search based on the overwhelming odor of marijuana coming from the vehicle. I've also conducted a probable cause search many times, in fact, hundreds of times, based on the odor of marijuana coming out of the car and found considerably smaller amounts of marijuana. 
based on that roadside investigation, depending on how much we found, we would send the motorists on their way in many cases if we felt they had not been driving under the influence of drugs. But sadly, as my colleague to the right just testified, Mr. Daggett, fatalities across this country have skyrocketed, including in the state of Maryland. Last year, the state of Delaware experienced a 42 high uh, record of fatalities in, in my neighboring county of Sussex County, Delaware. We have to be able to conduct a roadside investigation based on that odor to determine if, in fact, they are driving under the influence of drugs or evidence of a much larger crime exists. Thank you all very much. I hope you issue an unfavorable report on this legislation. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chairman, good afternoon. I'm Stephen Kroll, the State's Attorney Coordinator for Maryland, the Executive Director of the Maryland State's Attorneys Association, and I've been prosecuting cases since 1984 in opposition and unfavorable report asking in Senate Bill 51. I will incorporate Mr. Daggett's testimony, Mr. Schellenberger's testimony, and Sheriff's testimony and ask for an unfavorable report. Just to say one thing, they are exactly right about the statistics about the increase in deaths when it comes to cars and marijuana. And that should be on each one of your mind when you take a look at this bill. We don't want that to happen. We'd ask for an unfavorable report as to Senate Bill 51. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My questions are for Mr. Daggett. Mr. Daggett, the, the proponents of the bill appeared to testify here today that the nature of the suspicion, whether it was legal or illegal, was determinative. I want to call back to the previous bill where you referenced uh, someone in a red shirt and, and blue jeans. Is the nature of the suspicion being legal or illegal determinative when it comes to the reasonableness of a Terry stop? In order to, well, in order to conduct a Terry stop, you have to have reasonable suspicion that a crime has either just been committed, is currently being committed, or is about to be committed. So that's why you have to have reasonable suspicion. So when it comes to this, the offense would be smoking in a vehicle. Now, it's, it's, it's only a misdemeanor, and it's only a citation. It's a $25 fine. It still is an offense. Unfortunately, you, can't, you cannot search in the way the, the statute, the, the way the law in Maryland is, you cannot search be, uh, a person for a citation because you can't arrest them. So in this particular, in this particular uh, we'd, be, we'd be unable to, unable to enforce that law against smoking in a vehicle because you wouldn't be able to search it. I guess unless you saw it, unless you actually saw it, and anybody that's smoking in a vehicle, all they have to do is just put it out put it underneath the seat, swallow it, throw it out the window, whatever it might be, you would be unable to search the vehicle because you could never prove that, that, that offense. So therefore, it's a, it's, a wasted, it's a wasted statute, quite frankly. Alcohol is a legal substance, but could be used as the basis for reasonable suspicion that a crime had occurred. It could be. It could be used for, in the sense of a, again, it depends on whether you're talking about the driver or passenger. It, in reasonable suspicion, well, yes, but just outside of a car context, a, a knife is a legal thing to have, but a knife in certain circumstances could be reasonable suspicion that a crime had occurred. Absolutely, depending on what the circumstances were, certainly. I mean, That's right, and in your previous example, you said there was a suspect wearing a red shirt and jeans. There's nothing criminal about wearing a red shirt and jeans, but under certain factual circumstances, red shirt and jeans could be reasonable suspicious to continue an investigation. If that's, exactly. If that's what the report came and that's what you, the information that you had, it certainly could be. So just going back to, to vehicles, if, if there is an odor in the vehicle, the odor could be evidence that the amount is below the personal amount. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. But the odor could also be indicative that the amount was enough to suffice for possession with the intent to distribute. That's correct. And in fact, the odor could be indicative, as the officer indicated, that it could be sufficient amount to be in our kingpin statute. Absolutely could be. Okay. I think I understand. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, to the gentleman, um, either Wacomico or I'm sorry that, um, sir, that you just were up, you, you both quoted um, fatalities that and I think that you linked them to post 
cannabis legalization. Um, where did you get the data? Can you, can you elaborate that's, on that? I, I can I can provide you all that data if you I can I could have it done to you by early next week. It's it's NHTSA data. It's from every starting in Colorado, obviously. But is it in, so? It's post legalization of cannabis. You're you're attributing it to that and not to NHTSA is you. You know I know I'm familiar with it with DUI. No, but but I mean obviously we've had DUI fatalities going back since cars were invented. Right. That's, that, there's no question about that. But every state. Uh, and I think there are 21 or 22, every state that has legalized cannabis, personally used cannabis, uh, has experienced an uptake in, in fatalities based upon drug impaired, and it's usually, in, and it's a combination of cannabis by itself or cannabis in relation with alcohol. But every state that's done it has, and so there's certainly a correlation between uh, People, I mean, I think we all understand if you if you smoke enough cannabis, you're gonna you can get impaired, and that that's good. It's not safe to be driving like that. So, the, but every state that's that's in, uh, legalized it has experienced the uh, the uptake. And if you if you like those numbers, I can certainly get them to you. I mean, that's not a well. I can I can check them because I'm I'm familiar with that. I look at it a lot for other stuff. So, thank you. Okay. Sure. In response to um, I'm sorry, I keep turning. I shouldn't be doing. Um, do you, uh, uh, sir, thank you. Uh, you the, the question that you just answered, and I probably no doubt it's, it's gone up. Is there a way to relate that directly back to cannabis being found in someone's system? And so we have found of the fatal accidents and of, or at, at accidents, the number's gone up by 10%. And we have been able to attribute that to cannabis in 8%. I'm just throwing out numbers. So that we, I just want to be able to say, yeah, yes, they're right. It's definitely as a result. Uh, it's not anecdotal. It is definitely a scientific way of determining, uh, and, and if they've done it, who, as a driver of those uh, accidents that, caused the numbers to go up, how do we absolutely say it was attributed to cannabis and the change in the law? So, Senator, that's another problem with cannabis. That's what I thought. You cannot determine it. It's because there is no test Correct. like a breathalyzer Correct. that can quantify how it's affecting your system because it stays in your system for so long. And so I do know that there are some companies around the country who are trying to develop a test to see if they can equate it to a breathalyzer, but so far they've all been unsuccessful, uh, and it's mainly because it stays in your system so long. So that is an additional problem with uh, cannabis, which is why the bill uh, that you all put through that said smoking in a car uh, is a crime or is illegal, not allowed, because that was very important to add. Uh, but that is another additional problem. But what you can say when you look at the statistics that Mr. David was refer referring to is that there was an increase in each of the states that, um, that legalized cannabis, and nothing else in the law had changed. They didn't change their DUI laws. They didn't lower the numbers. Uh, so logically, you can attribute it. There's just no scientific way to attribute it. Thank you very much. And again, good seeing you again, and welcome it's back. It's been a long uh, time. To you. Yes. Nice to see you over here. Good to see you. You used and to be on that side, friends. right? <laughs> yes, and all of you. Thank you. And as you know, I want to get to the truth. I want to know, because everything we do down here, it's going to determine, determine whether life is lost, maybe, or someone's life is saved. And this is an important issue for me. And also, uh, are the civil rights of, of everyone. And with all the stats that I'm seeing, it shows that the one definite here that we know about with scientific evidence to prove it is that um, as sorry as it as I am to have to say it, and we, I've heard it all the time, and, and it's true. Black and brown people are the ones who are, whose lives are changed by this in many ways uh, all the way around, and I'm just trying to find a balance for that, and I think you've helped me well, to do that. Yes. Well, my, my response would be that when a police officer pulls someone over, over for right. speeding and smells an odor of marijuana, they aren't making different decisions based upon the color of someone's skin. And, um, and how do we get to these statistics that are proven and are true? I don't either. That's why. I, 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 I do not 
question of statistics. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Senator Carter, for letting me in. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Right. Mm -hmm. I said, Maya, I wanted to follow up on the um, Senator Musin in the Vice Chair's line of questioning, because this is where we, we get kind of – as we evolve and we're moving toward, uh, you know, the legalization of cannabis, recreational cannabis, so July 1st is, a, is an important date. But you get up to 2.5 uh, ounces, which will is just a citation. Um, and so where I struggle with this, like obviously I want to err on the side of public safety always. What I, where I struggle is that if we are legalizing a certain amount, you know, you're, you're searching based on something that's legal. Um, and so it's a weird kind of place to be. It's a weird space because any, there's no fruit of the poisonous tree at this point because you find a gun or something else. And, you know, I talked to our state's attorneys all, I mean, my state's attorney, and, and we've had 66% increase in recovery of guns last month uh, than the same time last year. And a lot of them are as a result of stops based on smell. So they, you know, so, and I'm, I'm going to ask for the data to, to, to back this up. But where I run into trouble is because it's, it's, a, it's a weird legal space because it's based on some, the search is based on something that I'm legally, you know, allowed to have. Um, and, and that's why I gave you the example of yeah. alcohol. You're legally allowed to have alcohol. You're legally allowed to have alcohol in your system up to a point. Um, and so that's why, as we heard from our law enforcement friends, it has to be coupled, coupled with other observations. So, so, you know, your classic DUI, I pulled him over for speeding. I smelled alcohol. He was disheveled. His, but you know, is, that is that true in all cases? Because, look, of course, in alcohol, you could smell it on my breath. But if I was carrying alcohol, you could never smell it. It was in a sealed container. There Whereas is, if I'm carrying cannabis and whatever, you're going to smell that. More and, likely than not, and you are. And that's, that's the space where I'm operating, where I'm, you know, struggling with, with this. So... If you wish to opine, that'd be great. If not, no, yeah. I understand. Okay. All right, uh, Senator West. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, Mr. Schellenberger, do you know what percentage of illegal gun seizures come from routine traffic stops? I, I do not know the specific number, but I know that there are quite a few. I think Senator Smith is absolutely correct. Um, you do get a lot of guns based upon traffic stops, a lot of guns. Thank you. guns are confiscated through stops, but 83 percent are confiscated in other ways, but very few stops for uh, marijuana or alcohol will lead to a, an, uh, a gun arrest, and the stats that I saw were 5 percent. Okay. So we can, we'll follow up on that. But again, just yeah. again, I mean, we'll continue the discussion, but it just, it's a thank you. I'm still, yes, sir. If I could, sir, you had mentioned how many uh, guns were found. As a sheriff of Wyoming, Comico County, like any law enforcement executive, I'm the recipient of a daily shooting report that comes out from Maryland's Coordinated Analysis Center. And what it does, it captures every shooting that occurs from Ocean City, Maryland, all the way to Deep Creek Lake. And 95% uh, of the time, uh, the bulk of the shootings are in the Baltimore metro and PG County. And I can tell you that the overwhelming majority of those victims that are being shot and the suspects that are being arrested are found in possession of weapons that are commingled with marijuana, almost always. And oftentimes there are felonious amounts of marijuana recovered from the underwear or the pockets of the victims at the University of Maryland shock trauma. And uh, on a weekly basis, the Baltimore City Police Department has to go into shock trauma to recover these weapons that are found when they start cutting the clothing off these individuals in the hospital. And, and I can tell you the overwhelming majority of the handguns that are found in Wicomico County are found on traffic stops. And we had a traffic stop just the other night of a pickup truck right on U.S. Route 13 in the city of Salisbury. And based on the strong odor of marijuana coming out of the pickup truck, a probable call search was conducted and three and a half kilograms of cocaine were found inside that vehicle. But that harkens back to an April 1999 traffic stop I made on I-70 out in Frederick County where I conducted a probable call search 
of two Southern California blonde-haired, blue-eyed men coming to Washington, D.C. from, from California based on the odor of marijuana, searched their vehicle, and I found a fabricated compartment constructing the floor with 87 pounds of cocaine. So I can tell you, oftentimes, there are very significant felony arrests that come out of a probable call search based on the odor of marijuana. And as a 38-year veteran, I feel we have a duty and a responsibility as the eyes and ears of everybody in this room to investigate, to conduct a roadside investigation to either confirm or dispel our suspicion based on that odor of marijuana. It's two, and thank you for what you do. Yes, sir. Thank you. I'm, I'm not a uh, professional statistical analyst, but let me ask this. You say 95% of those in automobiles that you stop. Now, no, 95% of the guns that we recover do come from traffic stops. They come from traffic Yes, sir. That now. The other sources from which you can confiscate guns may come from a number of other areas. Yes, sir. It may come from homes that you go into. It may come from those who are actually manufacturing illegal guns or bringing illegal guns in. When you take that 95 percent, and, here's a, and, and, and you compare that to other ways that to to all the other ways that you confiscate guns, I think that is what they, the, the, the statistics were saying, 5% of all of the other ways that you can confiscate guns. And they were saying that that was a very, you know, not insignificant. Nothing is that we're talking about is insignificant, but not enough to kind of ch um, change my mind about the bill based on the numbers. Um, that I'm hearing. So do you know if that 95% is a part of the whole? Is that the only place? And I know this is, this is um, um, just an um, example. can't be true. But if, if that's not the only way that you confiscate guns, when you put in all the other ways, most of them through homes, most of them through people that you stop. Yes, sir. Uh, who are committing crimes in the street. With a, not marijuana related at all. Uh -uh. Not not cannabis related. No, sir. At all. That's not 95 percent of where you confiscate guns from. No, sir. A prime example uh, on a Sunday night uh, several months ago, uh, we received a call at the Wicomic County Sheriff's Office that there was an armed individual at an apartment complex down in Pittsfield, Maryland, on the east side of the county towards Ocean City. We sent two deputies down there. They rode through the parking lot. I didn't see anyone matching the description. The description was a blonde haired guy, had tattoos on his face, little skinny kid. Uh, they didn't see him at all. One of my deputies decided to go back in the area about two minutes later and spotted him. He had a, he had a knapsack on his back. Our information was he was armed, but we have a duty to investigate. And as the deputy pulled up in his tie, the suspect took off running. The deputy gave foot pursuit, gave several commands for him to stop. The deputy was considerably faster than the, than the kid. When I say kid, he was, he was 19 years old. And the deputy ordered him to stop multiple times. And the suspect turned and, and shot my deputy in the head. Killed him, killed him instantaneously. Dropped him in his tracks. Deputy Glenn Hillier left behind a wife and three kids. This kid had an extensive record, not just for other crimes, but including marijuana distribution. Distribution. And in Baltimore City had been convicted of an armed robbery of a McDonald's with a semi-automatic handgun that he pointed at the clerk in McDonald's and when arrested by detectives and interviewed, they said, why did you have to point the gun at this girl? It was very traumatizing. His response was, because I can. Because I can. But this kid had an extensive criminal record, 29 previous contacts with law enforcement. He was only 19 years old. Several of those were marijuana related. None were cocaine related. None were heroin related, but they were marijuana related, and he was armed with a semi-automatic handgun with a laser sight and took the life of my deputy instantaneously. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and the reason we are all struggling so much is why we shouldn't have a statute and let the courts decide. All right. Uh, We've, we've had a little bit of tension going on with the judiciary the last couple of days here. No, I'm kidding. Um, but All right, I take that back then. Yeah, could we have, um, you know, it's, there's a difference between correlation and causation. And so, it, it, you know, it would be really helpful if we could get some of that information from you all. Um, and I'll, I'll do the same with my county as well because, 
you know, that, that would really help us in our decision making. So, yes, sir. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you all. All right, we'll now switch to our uh, virtual panel, and we'll start off with Miss um, Abdul uh, Malik. Sorry about the delay there. Welcome. Um, if you can unmute yourself, we're ready to hear your testimony. Yes, thank you for having me on. Um, I really appreciate um, the happy accident of going last because I have um, some testimony that directly address the opposing panel that was just up. So um, my experience comes from, um, I'm a Maryland resident. I am on the board of Maryland Normal. I serve as the um, event coordinator and liaison. Um, I also have served four years in the Maryland market as a cannabis regimen specialist. So I help people hammer out their cannabis routines, making changes when necessary. I've gotten several of them off of completely their medications. So I definitely am a proponent and advocate of its medicinal value. I would like to um, tap into my experience and share that um, with my experience working with patients, many of them do not have the privilege of smoking in their homes due to um, residential restrictions, lease agreements, um, children within the home, family members that don't like the smell are affected by the smell because of their own personal health issues. And so it's just not always possible to smoke somewhere else. So a lot of people, including myself, retreat to their cars because currently I'm in a living situation where I cannot have cannabis in the house. Um, a mason jar, which is supposedly airtight, is not enough to keep the smell from permeating throughout the house. So um, addressing the issue of um, the smell of marijuana leading to how much you have in the car, like that's just all because if I have seven grams, that seven grams is going to smell just as loud as the one and a half pounds or the two and a half, um, I mean, two, um, one and a half ounces or two and a half ounces that, you know, is going to be legal to um, have um, once the bill goes live in, um, on the first. So um, I would just like to share that it's really asinine to go based off of odor alone to um, have that be the reason um, as a probable cause because it's not. Um, many people retreat to their um, cars for privacy, for protection from the elements, for warmth, um, nosy neighbors, people don't, they don't want everybody all up in their stuff, like a car, like I said, you walk into my car right now, I will tell you happily and gladly, it smells like a whole pound in there. There isn't, but that's what it smells like. And that's not indicative of the amount that I have, or if I have other drugs, or if I have a weapon and any of that thing, uh, or any of those other things. Um, this also runs into the issue of cannabis um, medical card holders being able to have um, a gun. Like these things are not, they do not correlate the way um, it's being portrayed while um, I forget the exact um, phrase, but he said um, correlation is not causation. So we have to really get into, you know, the specifics on this and not just go off of odor alone to say, oh, um, I smell right. odor. So the person must have cocaine or um, weapons in the car. It's Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much for your thank testimony. You. Thank you. And thank you for your patience. All right. Thank you. All right. We will now uh, hear from Ms. Wilkes. Uh, you're up, welcome. Yes, hello, um, thank you for having me. Um, first, I wanna say I'm, I'm glad that I got to go last because I definitely was gonna lead on um, with a different kind of testimony. But I just wanna say that if the police need what should be an illegal tactic to use something that is legal in order for them to catch people doing other things that are illegal, then maybe they should be trained in different ways to do their job better. Because in the fall, the police, in the fall, overwhelmingly majority of uh, Maryland residents voted to legalize marijuana, right? And I've heard a lot of testimony and a lot of questions about um, correlating this with like alcohol and driving under the influence of alcohol. The difference between alcohol being legalized and weed being legalized is that you can have weed legally in your car in an open container or a sealed container. Alcohol, you cannot have it in your car if it's in an open container, which makes the two different. I also want to say that smell is subjective and it cannot be proven in court. Um, I have been on the opposite end of that where I was pulled over by a police officer and told that my car smelled like marijuana, even though I had just came from taking a drug test and provided a negative marijuana drug test to the police officer. I was 
searched on the side of the road, the most intimate parts of my body were touched by a stranger in public. A canine dog was dispatched out. And you know what they told me? Oh, we mistook the smell of marijuana for a banana peel. I think that moving on with this with an unfavorable uh, report would be anti-black, racist, and irresponsible um, based off of the racial disparities of those who are deeply impacted and directly impacted by being stopped and searched based off of solely the soda, uh, solely the odor of marijuana. Um, and I think that this needs to be taken in consideration. And as I said before, if we have to use a tactic that should be obsolete and illegal to find out what other illegal activities are going on, then the problem isn't the odor of marijuana. The problem is the effectiveness of the police. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ms. Wilkes. We'll now hear from Mr. Green. You're up. Welcome. Uh, hold on. Let's uh, go ahead and unmute you. Can you unmute? I'm sorry. There we go. Thank you, uh, everyone. My name is Rondez Green, and I am appearing in support of SB 51. I am a student at Bowie State University, HBCU in Prince George's County, and uh, I'm happy to, be, to have access virtually here. This is a wonderful point of accessibility, and I just wanted to highlight that as we're in class. Um, I recognize that Marylanders voted overwhelmingly to decriminalize cannabis last year. And so to me, it is important that the legislature is consistent and their promises to their constituents. So when I think about these practices that are invasive and dehumanizing or some words that I use, that I heard described, uh, that I heard used to describe these stops, um, unnecessary, um, a fishing tool and a remnant of the war on drugs, I align with that completely. And I think that it should be abolished. There's no reason for us to continue this practice. I don't want to make it about myself because we heard of um, a bunch of other wonderful stories, not wonderful stories, horrible stories, other people and their experiences in this racist system, this racist practice. I want to highlight specifically Councilman Mitchell being stopped, not having anything. It's a complete waste of your time. On the 4th of July in 2021, I went to Haverty Grace, Maryland, like I've done every year for my entire life to celebrate Independence Day with my family and friends. I showed up. Stopped at my mom's house. Nobody was home. I walked the dogs and I walked down to Tidings Park like I always do every single year. It's the middle of the day. I have a book in my hand. This one, actually. I walk up to the, to the bench at Tidings Park and I sit down. And moments later, by the way, the park's filled with people. Moments later, two officers walk up on either side of me, stop right in front of me. The only guess that I have at this point is maybe they smelled something, but I don't have anything on me. They proceed to question me, they proceed to get really aggressive, and they try to instigate uh, a reaction out of me that I'm not going to give them. I was poised, I responded appropriately, but I also have this audience of everybody at Tidings Park watching me be questioned by the police on a bench as I'm reading a book by myself. So if I were a different person, if I were in a different situation, maybe I would have ran. Maybe I would have responded a bit more negatively to this hostile interaction, this unnecessary, this invasive and dehumanizing uh, interaction that I also experience on the road, when I'm going into grocery stores, when I'm going into gas stations. The smell of marijuana is unquantifiable. We, you cannot quantify how much we may or may not have Mr. Green. if we just smoked, if we're about to Mr. smoke. There's no way to know. Mr. And I Green. think that this is unnecessary and needs to end. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. All right. We'll now hear from uh, Ms. Tyree. Good afternoon, Chairman Smith and JPR. I'm Nikki Tyree, Executive Director for the League of Women Voters of Maryland. Uh, we thank Senator Carter for this bill. The League believes in having the most robust and people-centric democracy possible, um, but that is hard to achieve when certain communities are continuously and disproportionately targeted and affected by out-of-control policing. We believe this bill is the right step on a still very long path to equity, and uh, we cannot have a true democracy um, when we still have mechanisms in place that allow further marginalization of Maryland's minority communities. You have our written testimony, and we urge a favorable report. Thank you. Excellent. Seeing no questions from the committee, we will now switch to the opposition panel. Uh, the opposition virtual panel. Mr. McAvoy, you're up. 
Thank you so much, committee. I appreciate uh, you hearing my testimony. You know, it's been a long day. Um, I want to start by saying that the focus on presuming that all police are horrible is what's at the core of this bill. And as I've debated this in the city. I hear flawed statements that every time a stop happens, it's because of skin color or because I shouldn't even be able to be pulled over for weed. Folks, this isn't weed. This THC product that is being used now is 80 to 95 percent pure. Arguing for drug driving or inhibiting road safety, like this bill would do, SB 151, is irresponsible and immature. And I highlight for the person who brought up the Constitution earlier, much earlier, this bill ignores the Constitution, supremacy clause. Um, presuming that all police are horrible or doing their jobs wrong in Baltimore City is a tired trope. Uh, and it's noteworthy because not one example, one, not one case, was given this entire long hearing about um, a case where this has actually happened other than gaslighting tropes and nebulous unnamed statistics. So regardless of what the M MOCO uh, OPD says, SB 51 will cause less checks for impaired driving and additional deaths. And in fact, House Judiciary, when they're reviewing HB 1 and 837 last year, their delegates acknowledged this will bring more deaths. They offered zero solutions. Officers are trained by weed. Montgomery County should know this. They do. Um, this bill is rushing things. It's putting the cart before the horse when we don't have any way of actually checking the, the potency. It's a tool in toolbox. I'm glad that all those people brought up the cases where serious drugs and guns were brought. You can look on any state police, Maryland State Police website, and see significant cases with drugs and guns and cash. Um, there was one on I-95 last year that was very large. So um, to Senator Muse's point, um, I don't know where AAA is getting their data but they rank marijuana deaths as number two cause now in Maryland. That's why they testified against HP1 and 837, two years in a row, I believe it is. Um, and we are seeing significant increased deaths. This is not a time- uh, Mr. McAvoy. Okay, I'll wrap it up. I thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Excellent, thank you very much. All right, seeing no questions from the committee, that'll conclude the testimony and the hearing for Senate Bill 51. Thank you, Senator Carter.